Okay, good evening everybody. With the posted time having arrived and a quorum of members present, I'll call the Capital Improvements and Street Maintenance Committee meeting for the City of Wassa to order today is Thursday, November 12th, 2020. Um, the first item on our agenda is to approve the minutes of our October 8th, 2020 meeting, copies of which are in the packets. Any corrections or revisions necessary for the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion by Larson, is there a second? Second by Ryan. Um, we have two members on WebEx, so we'll roll call vote our items tonight. Uh, Larson? Aye. Neil? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. I'll vote aye as well, and the minutes are approved. <coughs> Item number two is discussion and possible action on potential streets for community development block grant funding. I believe Alan has this item. You see some streets that have been proposed for block grant assistance. And we also have Tammy Strauss on WebEx with us if you have questions for her about that program. Welcome. So I think uh, Lori provided maps of the individual streets that originally those weren't put in. So if anybody has questions on which segments, I think Lori added that today. Um, so uh, we, we do have the potential to apply for, I mean, we, we are going to apply for CDGB funding. Obviously we're not guaranteed any money. And Tammy can speak to that, what that budget is. Um, we were originally thinking of, there's four streets that we're thinking of. Originally we were going to put up Second Street from Short to DeKalb, which is still on the list. Um, but we, we did look at some other streets, um, McIntosh, Torney, Henriette on Second. Um, Kind of the, the, the way these were um, come about, they all have to be in the LMI. The LMI map is attached with the different um, LMI percentages. I guess we, when I was looking at these, I tried to keep them in the purple on the map, which is the highest percentage in, in the LMI. You know, it's, it's, you know, it has to be over 51% LMI to qualify for this. So I tried to keep it in those areas that were, you know, the higher LMI, the, the, the higher low to moderate income areas. And also I tried to keep them like where it made sense to do one block segments, like Torney's one block south of uh, town line. So that makes sense to do that one block. Um, Second Street made sense to do one block. And the one block of McIntosh is kind of broken up by Prospect and the railroad tracks or St. Paul. So that kind of made sense to me. Um, Henry, I put on there between 12th and 13th. It's in really bad shape. It's one of the worst as far as the underground utility streets we have, but that maybe doesn't make as much sense in my mind because Henrietta needs to be done the next two blocks too. So it might make more sense to put Henrietta on a reconstruction to do all three blocks at one time. Um, so I don't know if anybody else has any questions or if Tammy, you have any input on this? This is one of those um, uh, funding sources where we have a window of time where we have to spend it down as well, correct? Yeah, we, we use, we'll spend it down right in 2021. You have to do it pretty quick though, right? I mean, we have to have our projects kind of ready so when the funding shows up, you're ready to get it going out the door. That is one of the unfortunate aspects of it. I think Tammy can say, I think a lot of times we won't get our funding until like you're the go ahead to like May or June. So we have to have it designed ahead of time and ready to go on. We'll usually have them sitting on the shelf waiting to start advertising until we get final word that we do have the funding. Okay. Um, Tammy, anything to add on Block Grant? No, I think Alan did a really good job as uh, identifying the um, potential streets. I drove them myself, and um, obviously I, I've got my opinions, but I'll save that for later. Um, <laughs> but you're right, the, the timing is, as far as availability of funding, unfortunately, it seems like we always have to do the streets later in the year because of waiting for the funds to come in. So timing, unfortunately, is we have to put the, the application into HUD very early and then we sit and wait until we find out for sure we get the money. Okay. I was glad to see that we have, um, even though we left Second Street on the list, that we kind of pushed that down to try to prioritize some other ones. Um, we did have some concerns in the Economic Development Committee. Um, we wanted to look at um, areas where we would, even though Second Street is low moderate income, um, there is a commercial development planned in that vicinity. Um, whereby the landowner or the developer would certainly be able to afford um, street assessments without help. And so we were looking to make an impact where people need it more first. And so, you know, assuming that we would maybe only get funding to do a couple of these, I'm kind of glad that we put that one down, down to the list a little bit. I, 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 
I don't necessarily have them in any kind of list. Just to, I so mean, they're this, not in order. No, they're not okay. in order. Not they're just kind of put on a list here. So I really don't have them in any kind of an order. And you know, I can Tammy can speak to this, but we've gotten typically between 125 and 150 thousand. I think last year we got was it almost 200 TJ to do First Street. So um, this is kind of pushing the upper limits of what we can expect to get. And these costs do not include sewer and water. They're just to build the street and the storm sewer. Okay. So the, the utility would still have to pick up the, the sewer and the water costs, which they always do on the street projects anyway. But I just wanted to make people aware of that. And there wouldn't be multiple funding of these streets. It'd be one, if any. Okay. Um, let's recognize um, Alder Larson first, and then Neil, and then Ryan, because they both got hands up on WebEx. Go ahead, Lou. Oh, I was, I was just going to make a motion to... Um, to go ahead with these projects. I've driven on McIntosh Street and Torney Avenue and, rough, they? and and they're real bad and I haven't I'm not familiar with Henrietta and and twelfth, but you know, I'm fifty percent is they're probably all bad, so I, I would just make a motion to go ahead and, and Okay. We can take a motion and then hear from the others. So we'll take motion from Larson. Is there a second? What is the motion for? The motion for to move ahead to get the funding for these streets to get be, to be repaired. Do you, to get the, do you want us well, we to get pick uh, one? For one street. Okay, yeah. so oh. we have to pick one. So we should move to yeah. pick one of these off the list. Is that yeah. what you're uh, looking? Yes, I guess I was asked to bring several options forward to this committee, not okay. just well, right. initially I had just put Second Street out, and I think there was some objection to that. So I brought a list, uh, you know, several streets together to. to um, hopefully, this committee can pick one to move okay. forward. Then, then, Madam Go Chair, yep. if, if I were to pick one out of these, uh, I, I mean, I'm sure they're all bad, but but McIntosh from Prospect to the railroad <coughs> tracks, that's that's a pretty heavily traveled street there, and I, I would put that on a priority list. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, let's see if we have a second. Do we have a second to Mr. Larson's motion to move forward McIntosh, um, assuming we can get funding? One more, one more request. Do we have a second for Lou's motion? Okay, motion dies for lack of a second. Let's hear from um, Alder, Alder Neal and then Alder Ryan and we'll see if we have an alternate motion. Um, go ahead, okay. Tom. Thank you. Um, well, yeah, I, I, I thought it might just be a little bit premature uh, to make a motion unless we kind of discuss the relative merits of the other three options, I think second. Uh, uh, should be off the table because of the nature of you know, one half of that block. You know, the, the east side of the block is uh, definitely uh, a, a higher income, probably uh, part of the neighborhood. Um, you know, I look at Torney Street, and it seems to be the longest stretch that we're talking about, the most uh, residents that would be impacted, um, which to me is a good thing. Uh, I think that uh, you know Alder Larson's suggestion on Macintosh is, is also a good one, uh, although it is a, a shorter block, if you will, by about oh I don't know uh, maybe four or five uh, house lots, something like that. Uh, so depending on which one is more may, maybe heavily traveled, uh, you know I, I, I don't know which one is busier, uh, maybe Macintosh, but that stretch of Torney sure is a. It seems like a, a much you know longer stretch, and, and we, we would be impacting uh, more uh, more residents. So okay. I might lean towards Tony. Anybody else? Um, let's Alder Ryan. Go ahead with your comments. Uh, can you hear me? We can. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I, I guess in last month I didn't. Um, I guess I didn't mention that, you know, a number of streets were done in the last, uh, I think, Tipple and Melky's administration, where a number of the streets, the uh, sewer was replaced, like um, on North 7th Avenue, um, like seven years ago at 25 below zero. Uh, using steaming and a contractor. So there are a number of streets that I know are in my neighborhood. I would think they may be in other areas of the city as well, where the lines were cleaned, steam cleaned, and then an inner plastic lining was put in the sewer pipe so not to have to uh, break open the street. So there are a number of streets around town that the sewer was already um, upgraded. 
So um, I guess I'm just wondering if there's some other streets. I know there was, I think, you know, North 7th for two or three blocks, uh, maybe on uh, Maple Street. Um, but I would think, Alan, there's other neighborhoods that had that. So then you wouldn't have the additional cost of upgrading the sewer and just deal with the water besides the other street construction and hopefully pick a street that the lead would be taken out of. But I had a question for Tammy uh, for the CD Community Development Block Grants. Uh, does it strictly have to be construction or could it be in like curb and sidewalk replacement like throughout the city? It's a good question. Um, for streets, it has to be a total replacement. We can't do an overlay because that's considered a maintenance issue. With sidewalks, you have to be very particular. You can't just replace a sidewalk, one block here or one one square here and then skip a couple of squares because they're in good condition and then do another one. You have to do a total block reconstruction. Um, there's a lot of rules with block grant when it comes to sidewalk. We've attempted to do it twice and um, the last time we were told we better not do that again. Okay, because I have had some questions from neighbors saying they're upset about how the curbs are being. Um, in looking at the maps though of the low income, is there another pot of money that we can use for those that are way low in the city that concerns me, um, that are very low income? Um, is there some other pot of money th from the state or the feds that so we could target some of those neighborhoods? That I can't answer um, as far as the funding that WASA has is either WASA funding, unless it's a state um, roadway, and, and I don't, I, I'm not the, the expert when it comes to roads, but as far as funding, block grant is the only uh, possibility for those lower incomes to help ease assessments, or in some cases, pay for the whole thing so there are no assessments. And that's what we're trying to do here. So whichever well, street, so whichever maybe, street, go ahead, Deb. Maybe it's something strategic planning wise we should kind of put in of what we may need in the future to look at income area and where the city funds streets in the future. Sure. Thank you for that. Um, I guess for me, I, I would like to see more uh, uh, streets throughout the city, not necessarily in one area. I know um, Lou has got some streets without even curb and gutter. Um, I do understand McIntosh uh, is very busy, especially you know because it goes east-west, and then uh, right right at the railroad tracks near Spectrum, there's lots of traffic, so that makes sense to me. But I guess I'd like to see a more diverse. Um, streets being done around the city, but when you're looking at um, the limited money, that can be difficult, but um, I just thought the, the sewers being done on some of these other streets might get us more bang for the buck. Sure. Thank with, you. With uh, regard to the 2021 budget also, um, the way the budget was proposed, um, this is one of the first times that we have not um, cut infrastructure projects out of the budget to make budget or keep the mill rate down. Um, and we were still able to roll out a mill rate decrease in spite of that. So um, the streets that we picked in this committee all survived um, the budget cut process. And so, you know, we, we will recall in the committee, um, they were gonna do a bunch in district one and we sent them back to the drawing board. And, you know, we then picked streets that we felt were worse. And so we picked, um, and I think it was maybe Rosecrans and Lou's district that was like god awful. Um, we picked um, Third Avenue in mind, we picked a couple others. And so we did get that mixed around town approach versus you know three or four streets in a zone. And all of that next year um, will get done in more of a spread pattern. So I think more neighborhoods could see help from us. And this would just be one more that we'd be adding. Jim. I have a question on uh, a couple of the streets before I make a decision. So Second Street, I under the way it sounds, we don't want to do that because it's under redevelopment. Um, why is that? Well, Blinker Construction proposed a project down there 
um, to build more you know townhomes and yeah, things like they built on third well with that um, being that there's a private sector developer there and that those pro um, homes are normally sold and they're sold at a higher price point it seemed like the impact to benefit low-income homeowners would be lost on a private sector developer got it and so we were hoping to find something where we could help people who need it worse okay second question is Torney would Torney be widened or would it be the same would there be curbs put in because there's no curbs there it's just sidewalk it, Torney is a narrow street and that's why we can get a longer section of it because there's not as much pavement it's not as wide so it's, the street is we wouldn't be able to widen it the homes are there it's going to be a challenge but you know so it'll be uh, like pretty much the same it'd be pretty much the same okay. configuration going back it'd just be new <laughs> okay we, we really don't have any room to expand there and that's why we can get a longer stretch because this it's only about half as wide. Okay. So I, you know, I, I think, you know, as far as bang for your buck, there, and uh, I think Deb had with the, uh, they're all lead, so we wouldn't pick an area where we wouldn't have lead services, so the water main would be replaced. Right. So any of these sections that are on here, do have the lead service lateral. So, but okay. you know, it's I, I think right now you're kind of in a choice between Tony and Macintosh, which you know are on the, t <laughs> just happen to be the top two on the list. That's not really the way I put it together, but. They do make the most sense. I mean, Torney, you're going to get the most low to moderate income homes, but on Macintosh, it is a it is a higher use street. I would agree with Lou that it so it does see a lot more traffic. Prospect was just done how many years ago? Uh, Three, four? Yeah, it's more than that. It's probably six or six probably years ago. So yeah. if we did Macintosh, that would augment that improvement in that area would be kind of good for a while then. Yeah, I okay. would I would support Macintosh. Okay, Alder Larson. Um, one other thing I'll mention about McIntosh Street is that it's, a, it's also a truck route. And okay. So, yeah. And, and it's, so it's a bike route too. So. And so you know you have you have semi trucks going up and down that street for Old Castle Glass. They use the old Marmette building and stuff mm -hmm. down there. And so that's why I would I would also recommend this street here simply <clears throat> because of that. Okay. Do you want to re-offer your motion from before about Macintosh, and we'll see if we can get a second now that we've talked it through? Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, okay, uh, motion to move forward Macintosh? Second. Okay. With a second from Wadinski. Um, Alder Neal, did you have a hand up? Uh, just to indicate, I, I would have a second. If okay, I, if all right, so we've got a motion and a second then to move forward Macintosh. <laughs> we'll go ahead and vote. Uh, Ryan? Aye. Neal? Aye. Larson? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. I'll vote aye as well, and so we'll move forward with Macintosh and uh, hope that we get that funding because that would be super helpful. Um, item number three is discussion and possible action on a preliminary resolution to vacate and discontinue Hilltop Road north of Forest Valley Road to the Termini. And Alan has this item as well. Yes, so we have been speaking with the landowner who owns that 4802, and he was looking at several alternatives and when it comes down to it, I, the um, the map doesn't show it a lot, but there's a it's a big just a big chunk of wetlands back there, and I don't know how that what I don't know if, when this was preliminarily put together that we were thinking about extending Hilltop to the north, but I don't think the city has any desire to extend that to the north, so I think it makes the most sense to just vacate that right away. What would we this is just a preliminary resolution to have the hearing, so we're not really voting on approving it. We're just moving it ahead to have the hearing. So I would recommend we would move ahead to, to, to do that. Okay, Jim, go ahead. The, the property owner is at the house in the city that's just adjacent? Yes, he owns, I believe it's 4518 or 4522. So it's not the house that's the, in the township? No, it is the house in the in on Forest Valley Road, um, 4518 or 4522. Thank one you. Of those two. Okay, um, do we have a motion to move forward to public hearing? Uh, motion by Neil. Is there a second? Yes. Second by Wadidski. Um, further discussion or questions? Uh, I have a question. Oh, go ahead, Tom. Uh, the the uh, property at the corner, uh, 4530, um, are they, have they been talked to about this? And uh, I mean, wouldn't this then become their taxable property if we vacated? Um, no. The, the land was all given then and it is all would be if with uh, 40 the the large chunk 4602 or is it 4802 i can't even read the map oh, 4602 4602 all that land would go so it'd basically be like a private driveway to get back there if we vacate it okay, okay. 
then the, all okay, the land so would go to that parcel. 4530, 4530 would not be impacted. They all get letters for the hearing though, don't they? Yes, they would all be notified of the hearing and they would all have a chance to come and, um, you know, speak their mind. Okay, Jim, go ahead. Is the property owner requesting this have street access now? So the area you see shaded is all public right of way. That is not, it's just woods. It's not used as anything. But I mean, he wants it so he can access that property. In Correct. The back. Is, he, does, he have, does he have access now? It's, he wants to build a driveway into there was his, is his. So divorce. we're assuming that he'll, uh, he'll use it as a driveway and build some type of thing, Correct. which will benefit the city in the long run. So, right. So if, if, if he did try to develop that someday, we, you know, the city might, be requested to build a road in there, which I don't think we have any desire to do at this point since it only serves that parcel. Okay. And so if he wanted to put something back there, he would put a driveway in there and, and request a, an easement across our right away to build the driveway. Okay. All right. Um, then with a motion and a second on the floor, we'll go ahead and vote on the motion to move to public hearing on this item. Um, Neil? Aye. Larson? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. Ryan? Aye. And I'll vote aye as well. And that item passes unanimously. Um, item number four is discussion and possible action on amending section 10.01.025, establishment of certain traffic limitations and rules. And uh, so you recall, I guess in the last couple of meetings of ours, we've had a couple of, I guess I would say spirited discussions about traffic controls and stop signs and, and traffic volumes and all these things. And you know, I, I think when we got rid of the parking and traffic committee, our goal um, was to kind of try to remove the politics from the placement of traffic controls. And, but yet we still, um, prior, um, groups of this committee and, and even ours continually find ourselves put in a position where we're being asked to make decisions where we're dependent upon engineering's expertise, but none of us are engineers. And we're kind of put in the middle between neighbors and engineers, but we don't have the skill set to engineer anything here ourselves. And so, you know, I got to thinking after a few of these discussions, you know, after we had a spirited discussion about 10th and Stark and we just had one in Lou's district about Buff Street, I kept thinking there's gotta be a better way. And so I asked Tara to do a little, little research on this and some municipalities do um, delegate the traffic uh, or the placement and modification of traffic signals to their city engineer. Now we would still um, get a report on an annual basis of any adjustments that were made if we would decide to pursue this and we would still be able to amend parking and you know deal with the time that you can park and where you can park and that stuff all stays with us. But the placement of signage, given the fact that they have a set group of standards that they need to follow and you know when we deviate from those standards, we can create liability for the city by you know making a decision that, that violates that. And I, so often I feel like we are pitted against one another or we're pitted against our engineers, or you know we've got a, a group of neighbors that believes that we should fix this for them. And I think that gets us to a point where we're trying to battle out a decision to solve a problem that if we employ the standards properly, it could be taken care of by the staff and leave all of the politics and all of us out of it. So. Um, what Tara brought back was a proposal that would enable us to delegate the authority to place traffic signals or adjust traffic signals to the city engineer. He would get those requests, he'd evaluate them, he'd look at the traffic data, he'd look at the standards and make a decision. And then every year report back to us on what has happened during the year um, with regard to that. And so I wanted us to have a talk about how you guys feel about that because I think as a committee, it doesn't do anything for us in our working relationship with one another to brawl it out over a stop sign or a, you know, whatever, and, and then feel like, well, one got it, but the other one didn't, or you know, these two got it and these three couldn't. I think that does nothing for our effectiveness. And so I want us to talk through this a little bit. You've got a memo in your packets from Tara about it with her work. And we have her on WebEx if you have some questions for her. Um, how do you guys feel about that? Tom, go ahead first, you've got your hand up. 
Sure. I mean, for the most part, I, I, I'm not against this idea um, because, you know, we've seen uh, uh, the interpretation, if it's very clear cut, uh, then, you know, we tend to vote in terms uh, with standards, in agreement with standards. But I'm a little concerned about uh, anything else that comes up that might be similar to the uh, Tenth and Stark situation in which it's close call. Uh, and, you know, not being able to have a, a, a say or a voice in that uh, on behalf of uh, our constituents when, you know, it is so close that, uh, you know, I, as the, the alder for this neighborhood, uh, would be taken out of that equation. I don't think that that's a good one. So what would happen if, uh, you know, a traffic count was done and it was close, like it was for 10th and Stark? Does, uh, do we then come into play or we just get a report? Well, in theory, employing the standards, the way this would work is that the engineer would make a decision, a consistent decision that employs the standards every time. And so at that point then, if his decision was no, that answer would be, the answer to that you know, neighbor or neighborhood would be no. But he would have the traffic data and the standards to back up that decision. And then you would have deleted the politics from it. So then when, you know, I, um, requester of these changes, you know, would come to you and say, you know, darn it, Tom, I feel like, you know, we need to do this or that. That decision based on these guidelines is outside of the alder's control. And I think that keeps, up, keeps from putting us in a position where, you know, I, I think there's sometimes people feel like we'll take, and in the past, the impact of the parking and traffic committee doing things the way they did years ago, did create some situations where now we have signs in places where there shouldn't be signs where they don't belong. And so what happened when we were trying to hash out 10th and Stark and Tara was trying to advise us was to say, you can't take one intersection that violates the standard that's knowingly wrong and use it as leverage to make another wrong decision because then you continue to multiply the effect of not complying you know, with guidelines that um, exist for a reason. And so that I think us stepping back from, you know, the, the placement of traffic controls, whether they're lights or signs or whatever they are, is a scientific process based on tra traffic movement. And none of us are trained in that, but yet the decision falls to us. So what happens then is we take the feedback from people who are trained in that, and depending on, you know, how much public sentiment surrounds an issue, we sometimes feel like we are obligated to throw that advice out. And when we do, it, you get to a point where, you know, those people that have that skill set are like, well, why did you even ask me? Because, you know, we didn't listen anyway. And so I feel like we need a consistent process where somebody that's trained to do this is the one making the decision every time. Jim. Uh, well, my concern is, uh, can you, you can hear me, right? We, we can hear you, Deb, go ahead. Okay. Um, back um, over five years ago, our neighbors had been concerned with a, a, a vehicle versus a, a biker accident that happened at 4th Avenue in Talon. And one of the corners was a blind intersection. So unless you were right in the middle of the street, there was no way you could see traffic that was coming east, eastbound on Talon. So a number of the neighbors got together and we brought it to the traffic committee and it was approved of. Um, originally it was thought, should we make it a three-way and it made it a four-way. And when we did have the big laundromat fire, it worked. Uh, there was a policeman there, but everybody was at the four-way stop, and it worked. Um, I'm not saying we should have four-way stops everywhere, but I, I do think what we didn't discuss before is that when you're in an area where there is a lot of pedestrian traffic or school, I can see where we need to be making decisions about stop signs, not necessarily because of speed, but because of pedestrian safety as well. But I guess um, I like the input of, of older persons getting it from, from neighbors and that 
sometimes the timing of the, uh, the traffic may not give the results the engineers or we are looking for. So there may be other factors that are involved, like uh, over in Tom's area with Athletic Field, um, that you have people going across a busy street at night after a football game. And so that, that's kind of something that may not happen a lot, but it is a safety factor. So I would still prefer to have all the persons in the decision making. Thank you. Okay, Jim, go ahead with your comments. Well, many, many years ago, we didn't have stop signs hardly anywhere. Right. But this idea I think is a great idea. You know, give it to the people that know what they're doing. They do a great job and we'll get on to other business when we have our meetings then. That's more pertinent. Uh, however, I would like uh, something in there that would allow the council or the citizens to get involved some way. Maybe if a couple of council members would, would bring it to council and then we could change it maybe by two thirds vote if we thought it should be different or if the citizens in the area, instead of calling their council per person, could just say, hey, if, if we can get over 50% of the people to petition in this two or four block area, maybe do it by petition, mm -hmm. but have some alternative where the council can get involved if they need to. That, that's interesting because I and I, I don't disagree with that we the trouble we had in parking and traffic so often was that um, that became you know a, a stage for political decisions for that placement partially because residents would be told by their alder well if you want to stop sign go out and get a petition and take it to this committee and so they would and I I only say that because it happened in my district and it didn't solve anything so you know the residents in my area were told go out and get a petition well we had some energetic folks that went out and every neighbor on the block signed for a stop sign at first and boss creek drive at the bottom of a hill and it hasn't solved the speeding. It, people run the stop sign, they slide through it. The snowplow can't even stop for it when it's coming down. So sign. bad, bad stop sign. And you know, we actually have toyed with the idea of going back over that action and taking that out of there because it's dangerous in the winter. We haven't um, because you know the neighbors that wanted it are all still there, but the speed problem shifted to Cherry Street and nothing's any better. So. You know, that's, had we not gone through that parking and traffic process and made a political decision about that sign, that corner, the traffic was stopping on Boss Creek. It wasn't stopping on first because it's often not safe to do so. So we created a situation there where those neighbors walked out really happy, but they, they've created a new problem, two new problems, Cherry Street and the winter stopping problem. So, I think that's why I would like us to leave the decision to people who know. I think that part of employing the MUTCD standards does require that Alan, if he was making these decisions, would evaluate vehicular and pedestrian conflict. You know, that's how they figure out how they're going to mark crosswalks and stuff. So, you know, I think that the standards allow for the same things that we feel strongly about, like conflict between bikes and peds and, and cars he already has to consider. And as alders, we always can request that he study an area and make a recommendation because if something changes, say an area develops and it has way more cars than it ever had. You know, and I'll, I'll use 12th and Randolph as an example. When Urban West opened with plans for a second Urban West, the vehicular traffic in that two block area basically tripled. And there was accident history at that corner. So that was causing people to say, wow, this is getting worse. There, there was actually not just accident history, there was injury accident history. Right. And so there was something to back that up with, but you know, it, it gets to a point where it, it, I think sometimes neighbors will request traffic controls without realizing what their intention is in the first place, like the stop sign stuff. So go ahead, Jim. I, I agree with you. 99.9% .9 is, that's, okay. that's how citizens are. They want something, but they don't realize how it's gonna affect everyone else uh, generally. So that's what we have to do is we have to take the good and bad and make the right decision. And even if we don't have an option or a way that the council can 
override a decision that we think is really inappropriate, I think this is still a great idea. Get it, get it to the people that know what they're doing, get us out of this that circle and let us do some other business and get it done because it's not hard to do street signs. It's all in federal uh, manuals. We have professionals that have been studying it for many years. It can be done by the professionals. Well, and that would allow us as a committee to focus on the big picture issues, like where we go with a $96 million list of infrastructure to do, right. where we go with you know, bigger decisions about how we can you know, solve the larger issues that face the community rather than one intersection at a time, because sometimes we end up with a spotty approach. You know, and it depends on who sits on the committee. Sometimes you'll have a committee that's like, nope, we're we're only gonna do it this way. And then you'll have another committee where it's a mixed bag or everyone will just throw the recommendation away. And you know, every couple years, you don't know which, where you're heading with that. And so that's why we sometimes now have a little bit of a patchwork approach in what we have out there today. And if we go another route with some of the speed problems we're having in the city, that might alleviate some of those and this would still be a good idea. Right, and I just, I guess as a follow-up to clarify that, um, as we were meeting Tuesday night and we were talking about this stop sign, one of the things that I had said at council that I wanted to do that I would support was a larger solution that addresses speed traffic um, through looking at the possibility of creating a traffic enforcement bureau within the police department whose focus is that problem solving all over town. And so I sent an email out to Chief uh, Bliven and, and Deputy Chief Barnes and I ask that they consider the idea and give us some feedback as far as first for feasibility and cost, because I think that would get us where we need to go without all of this. And since it was um, Alder Wadinski's idea, I asked them to invite him to that table because he's got years of skill and expertise in doing that job. So um, we're gonna try to meet next week and talk about that and see where, where it goes. And you know, if that's the case, we're gonna be bringing that to you know, through the committee process, if there's an initiative that gets us to a better place without worrying about placement of signage. So that's where I think we'd be in the, we'd be well served, I feel like, to do this, because then this committee can focus on the big picture. Uh, Tara, go ahead. Tara and then Tom. Tara, okay. I figured you'd call on Tom first. <laughs> well, your hand flew up first. No, he had his up first. Oh, I'm sorry, so I didn't see his virtual head hand, head I saw his physical hand. Well, I, I just wanted to take an opportunity to be sure that everyone um, does understand exactly what the um, manual on uniform traffic control devices is and where it comes from. So that's a document that is issued by the Federal Highway Administration of the United States Department of Transportation. And that specifies the standards for traffic signs, road uh, surface markings, signals, um, how they're designed, installed, and used. And it covers all kinds of things. And in the United States, all traffic control devices must substantially and, and legally conform to these standards. Now, our state has the Wisconsin MUTCD that substantially conforms to the federal um, requirements. And that is imposed on us to follow that by our state legislature. Um, is the, is uh, this this manual is uh, supported by a number of engineering and traffic organizations throughout the country, um, and the, the thing that does get a little concerning, um, you know, these are based on you know scientific and engineering studies. And, you know, as much as we may mean good things by saying, you know, well, we would like this or that, I mean, there is science and engineering studies that support the rules that are in this manual. Um, not following those rules from time to time can cause accidents um, and, and by not following clear, you know, some of these standards have wishy-washy sort of, you know, loosey-goosey things that, you know, can be interpreted one way or the other. But, you know, there, this not following this manual where there is a clear statutory mandate 
does pose potential liability on the city for um, signs that may fly in the face of, of these rules. And I, I just want everybody to understand that. When Nate Pekarski was here and he was the traffic um, control lieutenant back in 2014, he spoke with the State Department of Transportation and they cautioned that if a federally funded project goes against the MUTCD guidelines, that project may not be eligible, may end up not being eligible for funding. Um, they, they did, um, Point. He, this, this engineer from DOT indicated that um, back on County Road N, where it isn't in our jurisdiction, several years ago now, because this was in 14, where an advance warning sign wasn't properly placed, a judgment resulted against the township because of a crash that occurred. Um, so I, I just want you to know these things, you know, they're, they're serious things. They are based on engineering and science um, studies, and we are required to follow them. That's it. Okay. Um, Dr. Neal, go ahead. Okay. Well, uh, and thank you, Tara. I mean, I completely agree with the... the uh, the intent and spirit of, of what you say, and 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 I support us being data driven. Uh, I'm really concerned about how data sometimes is collected, because in the uh, instance of our 10th and Stark study, uh, which ended up showing uh, two very similar traffic volumes, yet that data was collected during a very short period of time during a pandemic, during a time when schools were closed, during a time when there was no football games at Tom Field, or, you know, there's, if it had been earlier, there's no, uh, nobody going to Kaiser Pool. These all would impact traffic, you know, and unless, you know, I'm gonna, you know, know that, uh, you know, city engineering is going to take that kind of thinking into, into play, when they're looking at stuff, rather do six days and we're done, there's the numbers, and now we sign on the dotted line. I, I can't, I cannot support that. I know in my heart that 10th Street probably would have outstripped Stark Street in volume if it had not been, you know, where we are in terms of um, the situation in society that is temporary right now. Therefore, I mean, I, I don't like relinquishing input uh, and impact on something that is not clear cut and clearly data driven, but is a, a gray area and right. some, some interpretation. And if I, as a representative of my neighborhood, cannot be a part of that interpretation or trying to dig further to get better data you know, over a longer period of time and during periods of time that indicate this is the norm Right. I, I don't like just saying, sure, I wash my hands again. I can't, well, I can't. And I think going forward, I guess if we kind of put it in perspective, the committee would delegate the authority to Alan. But that does not mean as 11 alders that we can't have a conversation with Alan and say, you know what, this is what I'm hearing from the neighborhood. This is what we've witnessed in the neighborhood. And... You know, much like any other problem solving that we do, whether it's through the community resource unit at the police department or whatever, neighborhoods offering feedback to city employees often is how problems get solved. And so, you know, if a traffic study is done at a particular point in time and there's mitigating factors, there is nothing on our books that says that you can't conduct a second traffic study or a third or whatever, you know, should the need arise or should something change. I mean, we really, we've studied Eighth and Boff three times, at least three times. Speeding, you know, where they hang the little device in a tree and figure out what speed looks like. I would bet in 12 years, I've had that thing out on Campus Drive and in the 1700 block of North First Avenue 20 times. I mean, it is... I can't even count anymore how many times, and it's in response to three neighbors. Yeah, but I think that uh, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the, the first study we did on Stark, effort uh, Stark and 10th, all that was measured was Stark traffic, and that was all only in terms of volume and speed, uh, and there was no 
uh, comparison to anything happening on 10th Street. So to me, that 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 was right there. We could we should not have made a decision based on that because it was incomplete. I think uh, maybe there was I think a, a breakdown in equipment or something for 10th. I, I don't recall. It's been a while. Um, but yeah, I, I just want to make sure that we have the ability to influence really robust studies that, that mm -hmm. reflect uh, the reality, the norm over time, that really, really gets down to what is the factual situation there, not a six days a snapshot uh, of in some point in time that might not reflect you know, what we're really worried about. Sure. Uh, Director Lemon, go ahead. And then we'll yeah, yeah, I think, um, you know, we get requests all the time to look at intersections, whether it's for, for pedestrians or whether it's for traffic backing up. So, you know, um, I just want to make sure that the, you know, all of you council members, any time that you want something looked at and we do look at it and you're like, you know what, that doesn't seem right. You know, we should do it during this time. We're happy to do that. Uh, we're happy to gather. I mean, the more information and data that we have, you know, it's just easier for us to make a recommendation. But you're right, Tom. I mean, five, six days worth of data, um, it's a very small snapshot in, in what's happening in, in certain areas. Yeah. So I think we that's, just need that interaction and that feedback and, and that's fine absolutely. With me. Okay. Yeah, I think we can get to where we need to go. I mean, many times they've studied an intersection and we've been the wait, school's not on. Go back and go back and study it when NTC is in session. Go back and study it when school is open. And they have, and then, you know, that maybe it has sometimes influenced a different decision versus studying something like that in July. So, yep. you know, I think, yep. and we, we all still have the ability to interact with them anytime we want you know, without having to vote on every single signage, sign place. Lou, go ahead. Um, I guess uh, I have mixed feelings on this as well, and I have to agree with Alder Neal in my situation where, you know, on 8th and Bob, you know, the MUTC numbers did not match, but but the, but the speed study clearly shows that, that that corner needs attention, you know, and, um, uh, so who do you what do you, what do you go by? You know I, the I state like says the state says we have to go by the MTC or what the the state thinks, but 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 the speed study shows different, you know. And um, yep. sure, you can put a patrol out there for a couple of days and then get it down for a couple of days, but then it's gone. Well, and that's the trouble you know, with us not having that traffic bureau is that it's it's there because it's. You know, that enforcement is happening as the sector patrol has time first, which they often don't. Um, second, it's happening in a spotty method because, you know, we complain to the police department, well, we've got speed on this street or speed on that street. Well, there's 11 of us <laughs> telling them that they're speeding on streets. We all have trouble streets. And they can only do so much so fast. So they go out and study it, and we ask for targeted enforcement. And they go out there and sit when they can. Now, I will say, at least in my experience with Campus Drive and with North First, when they go out there and sit there and write a few tickets boy does the word get out in a hurry and you know for a week after that or two behavior is modified and even if it's warnings they don't even have to write citations the presence sometimes is enough and so if depending on how this discussion goes next week if we're able to create a traffic focused resource unit within the police department using people who love to do that type of work and do it really well that may eliminate the requests for all of this. You know, you may see less neighborhood groups saying, hey, I need a stop sign here or I need one there because people are speeding past my home because that targeted enforcement won't happen only when we make a phone call or send an email. You know, every every month or so, they, they know, they'll know where the trouble spots are and they'll know where to target and they'll have hopefully entire shifts to do it in, not just an hour here and an hour there. So like in the Boff Street situation, if we know that that's worse, during shift change at Colby and Colby, then maybe they're out there at 6 a.m. and at 3 and stay out there for an hour or two. And, you know, when people see them sitting there, they're not going to go past at 40 miles an hour. You know, and I think that really is where the solution is. It's not in sign placement. It's in better enforcement. Jim, go ahead. Um, I think this is a great discussion, but maybe we need to have this in front of the whole council and let them have some input to... Also, so maybe this should go forward to the council. Yeah, because that's whatever decision we make, pass or fail, we send it to them anyway. 
So yeah. yes, if one of you wants to make a motion to send it forward, you can. And then we'll have that discussion in a couple of weeks on the floor and let everyone weigh in. So do you, want, do you want to make a motion to move it forward? I will. Okay, um, we have a motion by okay. Wadinski to move this forward, second by Neil. Um, further discussion or questions? Go ahead, Lou. Uh, so let me make it clear, we're not voting on this particular item, what we've been discussing. Well, we're voting we're, to- We're voting to move it forward to council. Well, we're not. We're not giving. We're not giving a count. We're not giving a committee recommendation. The, well, on, on this the agenda item. Committee. We should, as a committee, make a recommendation to um, move this plan ahead. I mean, are, pardon me for. Are we making a recommendation to approve this yes. and then send it on, or? Um, well, a motion to approve. Assigning the authority to the city engineer, yes, and then the council can decide if they agree with that or disagree with that. Okay, so but the motion is forward without the, any. The motion activity. is to to agree is, is is for this ordinance, not right because it's well, automatically going to go forward to the council anyway. Correct. So whether it's on a mixed recommendation or unanimous or whatever, I mean, okay. we, would, we would take a motion to approve assigning the authority to the city engineer. We'd vote on that and then our vote is gonna go to council and there's a final vote. And this next item for number five, amends all of the traffic ordinances to make that happen. So we'll have, we have two items that are kind of lined up together. So then the motion should actually be to approve item agenda four. Correct. That's the motion that I asked for. Was was that your motion, Jim, to um, approve this delegation of authority and move it ahead? Yes. Okay. So that's the that's the motion is to approve this and move it forward. And Tom was the second. Alder Ryan has her hand up. Go ahead, Deb. Um, I was just going to mention, um, while being an advocate for over the years, I have attended the different traffic meetings, and and I do realize. We kind of get into the little details of the nit and picky stuff. And a number of other council people may not be interested in that. And so by, I guess for me, um, I plan on voting no to this, to this uh, question because I do feel that some of the city council, they, they don't have an interest in this level of detail. And, um, and may just rubber stamp it. So, uh, but I just wanted to make aware to the other council members that um, some may not care about uh, this 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 level of detail that we are dealing with. Thank right. you. Well, and they may they may surprise us. So I think we need to give them that chance. Um, okay, um, go ahead, Jim. Hey. Uh, I disagree. I think all the council members do their duty and go over the packets when they get them, and they, I think they pretty much know what they're, they're talking about when they come to council. I mean, that's that's their job. So uh, mm -hmm. I would support every council member reviewing this and having their opinion heard. Sure, definitely. Okay, um, so then with a motion and a second on the floor, we'll go ahead and vote on this item. Uh, Ryan? No. Neil? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. Neil? Or Larson? No. And I'll vote aye. Um, so we'll show that that item moves forward on a three to two recommendation and we'll send that forward to council. I believe that will go to that, I think it's the first meeting in December. Actually, that might be the only meeting in December. I don't think we have two meetings in December normally. Um, and then, so item number five um, is the, um, ordinance amendments to make that delegation possible. And uh, so we'll take a motion on that as well. I'll read that it's discussion and possible action on amending section 10.52.020 police administration, section 10.52.040 police to investigate accidents and receive accident reports, section 10.52.050 traffic division to keep and use a driver file and repealing section 10.52070 official traffic control devices, section 10.52.080 designating crosswalks, safety zones, and traffic lanes, section 10.52.090 designating no left turns and methods of turns, section 10.52.100 zones of quiet and play streets, 
Section 10.52.110 Loading Zones, Section 10.52.120 Designating Public Carrier Stands, Section 10.52.130 Determining Certain Parking Limitations, and Section 10.52.140 Erection of Official Traffic Signs and Signals. Um, do we have a motion then to approve those amendments? Motion Move by to approve. Motion by Neil, second by Wadinski. Um, further discussion or questions? All right, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote then. Larson? Aye. Ryan? No. Neil? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. I'll vote aye as well, and that'll go forward four to one. Um, item number six is discussion and possible action on additional funding for multi-use trail along 72nd Avenue. And we've got TJ um, to come and talk to us about this item. We're in the design phase um, of a trail um, out in the business campus, and he's got some updates for us. I have an update. We just received an update estimate. Okay. Thank you. This is updating the tables. Okay. All right, so back in 2018, we received a TAP grant um, that <clears throat> federally, or that funds a trail from Packer Drive to a property just south of Air National Drive along 72nd Ave. That's an 80-20 split where the city would be responsible for approximately $160,000 for this trail. Um, as you mentioned, we are currently in the design phase. Uh, we just reviewed the 30% complete plans a couple weeks back, uh, and this is slated for construction in 2022. So as we've been moving along in this design, um, we've increased the scope and um, some additional costs have come into play. So since these were some pretty sizable changes, uh, we wanted to bring this back before SISM to um, get some direction on which way we wanted to go. So I'll run through some of these changes quick, um, and these match up with the um, spreadsheet that is in your packet. So the increased scope, as you can see on the map, what was approved in the state municipal agreement was the trail from Packer Drive to the property just south of International, um, and that would line up with a proposed trail running east and west. We don't know when that east-west trail is going to be constructed, so we thought it would be best to continue this trail that we have funding for um, all the way up to International. Uh, and that's about 500 feet and increases the cost by $75,000. And then during the initial concept design, uh, DOT said that we needed a additional lateral clearance from the roadway to this trail. So um, to get that lateral clearance, our consultant Kapoor gave us two different options, a rural option and a urban option. The rural option would um, manage water using ditches and a, a gravel shoulder, and then the uh, urban option would add curb and then manage stormwater through a, a piped network. <clears throat> the um, pros for the uh, rural option is uh, decreased cost uh, initially and then, uh, but that also leads to higher maintenance costs, uh, potential for water to cross along the path and ice. Uh, so safety concerns, additional real estate because pushing the ditches out further would push those ditches on to some of the adjacent properties. So we'd have to purchase property. Um, and then the uh, pros and cons for the urban option are just the inverse. Um, it's a higher initial expense, but the uh, long-term effects are, are better. Um, so then, as I mentioned, pushing the, the ditches out and, and this path out further, um, we would have to purchase some real estate. Um, five TLEs would be required for the rural option, and then two, this is a air um, PLEs, which are permanent easements for uh, the drainage ditches. 
And then the urban cross section are just five TLEs. And then also um, increasing the cost is a refined estimate. As we div dive deeper into this project, um, some more realistic costs are coming into play and uh, different contingencies. So with these different options and increased scope, we provided three options. Um, option A is extending all the way up to International Drive and that urban cross section. Option B is also extending all the way up to International Drive with the rural cross section. And then option C is the uh, least expensive, which is not extending it and then using the rural option. We recommend uh, option A, which on this initial report is <clears throat> for an additional $330,000. This new spreadsheet I sent out um, would lower that to an additional $275,000. And for those that do not have the spreadsheet, um, this change would affect option B. It would reduce the cost by 155, or let me rephrase that. The additional cost to this project would be $155,000 for option B, and option C would be an additional $75,000. Okay. Um, Alder Ryan, go ahead with your question. Um, could you um, explain, I guess, from how, how far of a distance is the um, changing it from the 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 the, uh, the little blue lines to going to international? How far of a distance is that? To it's the about, block or two or what? It's 500 it's, feet. I guess I, in my opinion, I don't see the benefit of 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 extending it. Our thought was that you know it extends it to a. Um, an intersection instead of just having a dead end in the middle of a property. And it also extends it, I believe that's East Bay up at International, which uh, employs quite a few people. And we think that that would um, benefit a lot of the employees up there that would probably be using that trail. We had, when we applied for the grant, we had some concern over um, semi-truck traffic conflicting with pedestrian traffic and bike traffic out there where as these subdivisions um, on this map to the east start to develop, um, you have more people out there that are walking and biking in the evening as well as the workforce that's out in the business campus. And on 72nd, semi-traffic is supposed to be on that road, but it's dangerous for people to bike and walk out there. So if you create that trail, um, you know, that does um, serve the public better. And I believe that our portion of the trail, um, but for the grant, was um, to come from tax increment district funding in that area just because it served the public, the greater public, and not just the adjacent property owners. Was that true? That is correct. Did you talk with Marianne about that 275000 on option A? Does the TID district have that funding for us? We do. She doesn't. She doesn't know the exact numbers at this point, but she does believe by, since this is still two years away for construction, she does believe that we will have the funding to uh, support the additional funding, uh, $275,000. Yeah, because it's not often that you get 80-20 money, 80-20 um, money, money on a grant. Um, you hate to let that get away. Jim, go ahead. Is this extension solely the financial responsibility to the city or is it still 80-20? So this, $330,000 would be solely on the city. Um, they will, uh, DOT will not uh, continue that match for anything above what uh, was initially awarded. So, and anything out of scope. So that extension 500 feet is out of scope, that'd be solely on the city. But, you know, there's sort of a, economies of scale as well. If we ever do wanna do that short stretch, you're just doing a shorter stretch and not uh, getting a contractor to do a mile plus 500 feet and get a bit much better price. So if we had to go in there and install that 500 foot connection later, we'd pay considerably more. Correct. Good to know. Um, 
Okay, um, Lou, go ahead. I think that we probably should go ahead with that extra 500 feet because anything short of completion is kind of a half measure. And it, like you said, uh, Madam Chair, it's just gonna cost us more in the long run. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It feels like it. Thank you. And yeah, yeah the, the more homes that develop out in that area, um, that does create the potential for, you know, people who want to, you know, bike, walk, whatever. And, you know, that the industries were out there first, but there there is a potential there for injury if they're in conflict with a semi truck. So um, do we have a do we have a motion to accept option A? Would you like to make that motion, Mr. Larson? I would, yes. Okay. Um, so we have a motion by Larson to forward option A. Do we have a second? Second by Ryan. Um, further discussion or questions? Okay, I think we're ready to go ahead and vote then. Um, Larson? Aye. Ryan? Aye. Neil? Aye. Wadinski? Aye. I'll vote aye as well, and that passes unanimously. Um, item item number seven, uh, we're getting to the end, 2020 construction projects update. And I think Alan's got that item too, or do you have those? Oh, Alan, here comes Alan. Do you have a print out? You need a bigger phone? <laughs> So the list is really narrowed down because I took all the projects off that are done. Basically, our, you know, our street reconstructions are done. Um, just if you want, I'll just go down the list here quick. Fulton Street is done. The lights were turned on actually yesterday. So that was the only thing that was waiting was the lights. The lights were all up, but we were waiting for WPS to get them power. They got them power yesterday. So I'm actually on my way out of here. I'm going to go look at them. Um, the river walk on Thomas Street was getting paved this afternoon. So hopefully that is uh, done. The, 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 excuse me, the paving will be done. We're still waiting for the railing. The railing is scheduled to be in about two weeks, so they'll put that railing up when they get it. Uh, the siphon project, they were supposed to pave the parking lot today. They got delayed, their paver broke down this tomorrow. The connector trail down here by the Dudley Tower, we're waiting for a few items there, the railing and the, the light bollards. Um, but the, the trail's substantially complete. We found on some of these projects that with the given climate and, and COVID, we're having problems with getting supplies for them, including the rails and the lights has been a real issue. Scott Street signals, it's going along pretty well. Again, they're having a few issues with some of the supplies and the poles and the lights, but they still expect to be done by the end of November. The Third Avenue, the emergency repair of that storm sewer, it took a little longer than expected. It was, uh, it was quite an adventure. We got some pictures of the hole. It was, uh, it was a 25 foot deep hole in the middle of Third and Third and uh, Wausau, so that was, they, they do have the, the storm sewer repaired. Um, they're uh, pouring concrete out there today. They hope to finish up the concrete tomorrow and have it back open to traffic on Monday. So it'll cure over the weekend, be open on Monday is the plan. It, hopefully they get it all paved tomorrow, depending on the weather tonight. Um, the TDS fiber, that's still an ongoing project. They still have crews in town putting in the fiber. We get. You know, we're, we're managing that in engineering. We do get you know, concerns, complaints just about every day, but it's been going fairly well. If some, some, you know, there's challenges with every project, but they're putting a lot of conduit in the ground. So um, that'll be an ongoing project till they get froze up and then it'll start again next year. But for the most part, our projects are gonna finish up this year with the paving um, and everything. It'll just be, like I say, a few railings and a few lights to be installed later. So okay. if there's any particular questions well, I can answer. Alder Ryan has a hand up. Go ahead, Deb. Okay. Um, I did receive a call this afternoon uh, from Walter Kleinschmidt. I believe he was the alder person before Gary. Was Is that the case, Lisa? Uh, Wayne Kleinschmidt. He was actually uh, quite a while before, before that. But yes, he's the prior council member. Okay, so, but he's, he's retired, but he's still out there looking, and um, he had called me over a month ago. I was concerned with the Bridge Street resurfacing, and uh, he ended up calling Tom Hardinger uh, from the Wisconsin DOT. I guess he's a bridge engineer and took a look at it, and he fe feels... Um, 
the city didn't get what they paid for and that a number of neighbors are complaining and it may be something that we need to um, have addressed. Thank you for that. Um, the council president and I actually also received similar concerns from Mr. Kleinschmidt and others. And so last week I asked the Board of Public Works to hold final payment on that project until they can get a look at um, the quality of the poor and figure out what might be wrong there. And so I think that happened yesterday, right? Board of Public Works. T oh, TJ. TJ's here. Um, TJ, can you give us an update quick? Sure, yeah. The Board of Public Works is on Tuesday. Um, so I also called um, Tom Hardinger uh, yesterday, I believe, and we met out there this afternoon or this morning. And um, he did think that the ride quality on the south half of the bridge was not up to um, you know standards. So we are going to meet on Monday. Uh, it'll be myself. We'll have two representatives from, from WISDOT, um, the contractor, Lunda, and then also our consultant that was out there for the poor heirs. And we will be using, um, uh, what is it, a, a 10 foot level basically that will be provided by WISDA, which they use to um, make sure that the, the poor is within spec. So we'll be um, checking that at least the south half um, on Monday. And if you know, we find that there's deviations from what's accepted, um, we'll move to that north half and check that as well. And so okay. if, if the findings are that that poor, um, either the, the cure or the poor or the, you know, the, the, any part of it is subpar um, based on the contract, we should have recourse within the contract and having held the retainage that we could compel a fix in the spring, correct? Correct. Um, the way it reads is if there's a deviation of an eighth of an inch over that 10 foot stretch that they can grind it out. Mm -hmm. um, if there's a deviation of where there's over a half inch, then that's a complete replacement. Okay. So we'll we'll find out and we'll you know make those repairs within spec. Perfect, uh, Mr. Wad, uh, Jim Wadinski, go ahead and then Lou. Um, I thank all the Ryan for bringing it up because I felt there might have been something wrong when I first drove over that first section. It did, just didn't feel right, and uh, I appreciate the her getting that re citizen complaint and bringing it to the committee and making sure that the city investigates that because that's uh, the right thing to do. Yeah, yeah and right. it's, it's an expensive job um, for us to pay full price for it if it's not right. So, um, Alder right. Larson, go ahead. I had the same, I think probably got the same guy on the phone this afternoon. He was at my lunch hour and and he was quite loud and quite rude. Oh. And I just said, you know, I, with all due respect, you need to contact the other person in your dist in that district. That's not my district, and maybe that was not the right thing to say. But um, no, that's fine to say. You don't you don't have to take that. So yes, um, thank you. Yep, no, it's it's fine. And so, and I had talked to him a couple times, and I said we would find out first if there was some mitigating factor, um, but that we would certainly look into it. And I know that he's talked with about a half a dozen council members. So. That said, I think the fact that you know any of us can report back to Mr. Kleinschmidt that our staff is on the case and that we're gonna try and figure out what's wrong and if it needs fixed, we're gonna get a fix. I think that's all he wanted. So I'm glad that you guys are digging into that. So uh, Deb, is your hand up? Is your hand stuck or do you have another comment? Yes, uh, Go ahead. just that uh, Mr. Kleinschmidt was nice to me, but he had, I and I had mentioned, you know, could he come to the meeting tonight? He said he met with the engineer at the bridge today, and um, it just seemed like he was being helpful, but he had said his wife was coming home from a nursing home, and so, um, you know, Maybe I was one of the first ones he talked to. <laughs> so I'm sorry, Lou, but he was very nice to me. Okay. Um, the other issue, I guess, uh, I wanted to bring up about the railing um, along the river there for Thomas Street and that for the river trail. That, you know, over the decades, uh, I've, I've heard of, you know, people walking along the Mississippi or in Stevens Point where there wasn't a railing and some some unintentional drowning. So I wasn't sure what what the the details were of the railing. Is this gonna be like a cyclone fence? So to encourage people not to go under the railing or if they're intoxicated and potential you know, so we don't have some potential uh, drownings. 
it, it'll be an it'll be an ADA railing. It'll, I believe it's going to be 42 inches high. I mean, if somebody wants to climb over it and jump in the river, they're still going to be able to jump. They're going to be able to climb it and jump into the river. We, we're not going to put that, but it'll it'll keep people from. It'll be basically hand railing height to keep okay. people on the trail. Excellent. Well, and we do have a lot of sections of the trail where there is no railing at all. It's close to water by some of the, in some of those areas, but I'm glad to see that we have one there. So, um, okay, with that, that brings us to, oh, go ahead, Jim. TDS Fiber, have they connected to any homes yet? I asked that question today. We actually have a weekly construction meeting, and they do not have any active services yet. They're pulling fiber, and they're hoping to get some active fiber here soon because they're not paying their bills at this point. But um, yeah, they they do not have any active customers yet. They do have a lot of people on the waiting list, I guess. Thank you. I guess, and they've been walking neighborhoods, I guess, basically selling some of that stuff door to door. And they happened through my neighborhood. They had a talk with my spouse and it sounded like if you opt in, they want entire neighborhoods to opt in together so they can do one install and pull it to all the homes at one time. But um, you know, the forecast of people opted in, they were telling us maybe spring so, you know, if they're developing a wait list, they, it doesn't sound like they're going to hook many people up in the winter. So They have about half the conduit in the city that they need. So they'll be in that. So next year again? Next year, it'll be all summer again. So it'll, okay. be end of, end of, so it'll be into fall next year before they're completely done. It's a two-year build. I'm glad that you guys are connecting with them, though, because sometimes the restoration work that they've done on people's boulevards has been really good, and sometimes it's been really bad. And so thankfully, um, you guys have been on top of those complaints. I've had a couple of residents that were not happy, and uh, they were made to come back and fix stuff, and that really helped out. So thank you for that. Um, with that, um, the only other item we have on our agenda is number eight, which is future agenda items. Um, if anyone thinks of anything that you'd like to see on a future agenda, let me know. Um, I did get an email today from Alder Ryan um, looking at a concern that one of her residents has at the intersection of West Wassa Avenue and 28th, but I think it's a drainage issue, and I think you guys can work with the homeowner and Deb without the committee action, but if we need to make some modifications to stormwater after your review, let us know. But I think okay. in the interim, you can work on that TJ's already gone out. TJ's going out there? Okay. So um, we'll stay tuned with that. And if there's something that we have to either fund or vote on as a fix, then we'll have that later. So um, we, have no more, we have no more items. So if someone wants to move to adjourn, we could go home. Uh, motion move by Wojcicki, second by Ryan. <laughs> Members in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 We'll stand adjourned. And thank you, everybody. Send those people out.